with Darwin, did the public embrace his ideas immediately, or did it take some time? Some did. Um, many did not. Some churchmen did. Uh, Charles Kingsley was a, was a devout churchman who did. Hmm. Um, many people found it very difficult. Uh, Wallace, who was the, uh, Alfred Wallace, who was D Darwin's co-discoverer, wrote to Darwin and said, to you and me, it's as clear as daylight that the power of selection can be done by nature, not just by the human. And natural selection, Darwin's phrase, was as clear as daylight to Wallace, but so many people misunderstand it. They cannot conceive that you can get selection without a selector. And so Wallace begged Darwin to change his phrase from natural selection to survival of the fittest, which has less of an implication of there being a selector. Mm. And Darwin did adopt the phrase survival of the fittest, which has actually been invented by Herbert Spencer, but Wallace tried to persuade Darwin to adopt it. Um, so Darwin continued to use the, the phrase natural selection alongside survival of the fittest. Are there problems with using the language of survival of the fittest? Like, do people hear fittest and think it's the strongest, which it isn't? Well, always? that's right. When in, D in Darwin and Wallace's time, that's what it did mean. It, it meant the strongest, the keenest of eye, the sharpest of wit, and so on. And um, later on, when geneticists started to, in, to get involved in evolutionary theory, which was quite a bit after Darwin, quite a bit after Darwin's death, um, after Mendel's genetics had been rediscovered at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, mathematical geneticists needed a, uh, an algebraic symbol, they called it W, fitness. So fitness became, um, it almost a tautology, just, just the, the fitness of an animal was um, its capacity to survive and reproduce measured as, for example, the number of its grandchildren or the number of its great-grandchildren. So um, the survival of the fittest became a tautology because um, that's, what, that's how you define fitness. In Darwin's time, it was not a tautology because it really did mean the strongest or the swiftest or the cleverest. Um, but then in the hands of the population geneticists, survival of the fittest became a tautology. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. We might as well say, um, if you if you object to it as a tautology, you would say, I don't know, um, it's no good breeding racehorses for speed because it won't work because it's a tautology. I mean, it, it, of course it'll work. Um, you, you, this, the, the original meaning of fitness there, in, in, as speed in, in this case is still there. Um, but um, I don't like using the word fitness actually for that kind of reason. Um, uh, but but it is it is a favourite word of of evolutionary geneticists. Some people have called you the, the Rottweiler of Darwin. Is that a compliment? <laughs> I was called that, yes. Um, well, it was a takeoff from Huxley, who was called Darwin's Bulldog. Okay. Okay. But, but uh, actually, Rottweilers are very charming, sweet dogs, so I don't really worry about yeah. it. <laughs> was this something at an early age that just naturally clicked with you, those ideas of Darwin? I know you, I know you, were, you know, were brought up with various exposures to the church, but early on? Did, did Not really. I mean, I think my father explained, explained natural selection to me. He'd, he'd read botany at Oxford. He was a biologist. Um, but I didn't really appreciate it. I mean, I understood it, but I didn't think it was a big enough theory to do the job. Um, and I think it was only when I was about 15 that I kind of realized that it actually was big enough to do the job. And there's nothing else. I mean, it, it, it has to be big enough, but it is too. I mean, now, now we know it's plenty of evidence that it really does work. Did, uh, <laughs> when you grew up in Kenya, did that exposure to nature and the animals... Well, actually, I left sense? Kenya when I was two, two. so, so okay. no. But, but, but I could have done, because my father then, my parents then moved to what was then Nyasaland, which is now Malawi, which is in, also in Central Africa. Um, but no, I wouldn't say that I was that exposed to wildlife in a way that I rather now wish I had and have been since. I mean, I've been back to Africa frequently and have been filled with great pleasure to go around national parks and things. I, I spent some time in Botswana. On a I, me too, oh, yes. Oh, it's magical. It's yes, just, I quite agree. It's mm. just, it's like a 24 hour a day show. It's just incredible yes. to see what's happening mm. and the, 
the biology and the evolution and the you know the interactions between prey and predator and it's it's all right there in front of you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> when 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 you wrote the selfish gene, did you know it was going to be such a big deal? No. Um, it's your first book. Yes. <laughs> I, I I remember jokingly referring to it as my bestseller before, while I was writing it, and and, and I, obviously I hoped it was well any author hopes is it could be a bestseller. But, but, but was that a joke or did some of it was, it, was a, it, was, it was a joke. But um, you knew you were talking about some groundbreaking ideas. Well, yes, sort of. I mean, I I they they were idea. I thought I was really putting into a different kind of language. Um, ideas which were current in among professional biologists. Indeed, I was. That's exactly what I was doing. But the way I put it seemed to catch, an, catch, catch the public imagination um, in a way that it hadn't been caught um, before. It, it, it was the, the idea that the, the gene is the unit of selection and the, um, I mean, that, that's just the way population geneticists would express evolution. Um, they would tend to put it at the level of the individual and say the individual, um, the I individual's fitness is measured by its success in reproduction, which right. means passing on its genes. I twisted that on its head and said, therefore, the genes me measure of success is how much, how far it survives. So, and that seemed to me to be a much simpler way of putting it, because if you, if you talk at the level of the individual organism, then you have to say the individual organism is not trying to survive, except insofar as survival leads to reproduction. And not just reproduction, but passing on genes to the next generation and so on. I thought it was a much simpler thing to simply go straight to the level of the gene and say that it's the gene that's the level of selection, and it's the gene is using the individual organism as what I called a survival machine to get itself passed on. So the, the organism, the individual, is a tool of the gene, of the genes, to get passed on. And those genes that are successful are the ones that are very good at building individual bodies. But the body is a, a, a machine for passing on the genes that created it. Hey, it's Brian Rose, founder of the DeFi Academy. I've told you my four week crypto bootcamp is amazing, but don't take my word for it. This is what my students are saying. The DeFi Academy was an amazing experience for me. It took me totally out of my comfort zone. In this course, I was challenged. I was held accountable and pushed to do things that honestly weren't always easy. It's been phenomenal and I can't believe uh, we're already up on our four weeks. It has flown by. Going through this DeFi accelerator by far was one of the best courses I've taken. You do this course, you really get into the nitty gritty of the activities that will make you comfortable with decentralized finance. Thank you so much to Brian and everyone at London Real and the DeFi Academy for even putting together an amazing course like this. Anybody else that wants to do it, please sign up. It is well worth the money.